the waters of the Nile. Rising in the rainy heart of Africa, the mighty river conquers the shimmering heat and aridness of the Sahara Desert, before surging, still full of power, into the Mediterranean. A verdant paradise separates the river from the endless desert. Sometimes several hundred meters wide, often it narrows to just a few paces. In ancient times, the fertile, silt-bearing waters of the Nile gave birth to two advanced civilizations, the one that of the light-skinned Egyptians, the other which stands in its archaeological shadow, that of the black African Nubians. The Egyptians referred to their neighbor on the upper Nile in present-day Sudan as Ta City, land of the arrow. Nubian caravans brought ivory, slaves and gold from the African interior. Their greed for these raw materials soon turned the pharaohs into aggressors. They invaded the black kingdoms. Thus the name Nubia, from Nub, the ancient Egyptian word for gold, appeared for the first time. But then a mountain caused material greed to pale alongside spiritual fascination. Around 3,500 years ago, Thutmose III fought his way through to the fourth cataract of the Nile, into the heart of the Nubian Empire. There, he came across this symbol. 70 meters high, it stood in front of a mountain. The Egyptian ruler saw the pillar of rock as a huge rearing cobra, as a sign of majesty, as an indication of the presence of Amun and of Ra, the sun god. Thutmose had a temple built, which was guarded by the stone snake. The temple was excavated in 1916. Since then, sand has again covered most of the ruins. On the opposite bank of the Nile, in a landscape which in those days was still characterized by savanna, the Egyptians founded the city of Napata. Today, only the foundations remain, and they leave certain questions unanswered. In fact, we know little of how people here lived 3,500 years ago. Perhaps their lives were not all that different from those of their modern-day counterparts. Jebel Barkal, the pure mountain with its temple complex, also developed into an important religious site for people in far off Egypt. For centuries, however, Nubia itself remained a colony, its inhabitants enslaved and exploited. And yet, time and again, individuals found themselves in a privileged role as overseers, soldiers, or even military commanders.
Their common religious roots at Jebel Barkal linked the destiny of both peoples, Egyptians and Nubians, in a strange way. Three thousand years ago, the colonial power of the pharaohs began to decline. And in Upper Nubia, an independent state emerged once again, the kingdom of Kush. Napata, opposite the holy mountain, became its capital. We still have no idea why its black rulers suddenly adopted the cult of Amun and had themselves buried according to pharaonic custom. While in Egypt, the temples of the pharaohs were falling into decay. Around 2,750 years ago, the Nubian tribes were united by a king called Kashta. The foundations of temples and palaces at the foot of the holy mountain still bear testimony to his architectural activity. In line with Egyptian tradition, he had an avenue of ram sphinxes built. Then his son, Pia, came to power, and political events happened thick and fast. Pia conquered Thebes, then Memphis fell. Sensationally, Pia became the first black ruler to ascend the throne of the pharaohs in far-off Egypt. Once again, the magic of Jebel Barkal had influenced history on the Nile because had he not come from the place of the rearing cobra and the sun god Ra, for someone from the land of Kush, tenure of the throne in Thebes would have been no more than temporary. Thus, the Nubians came as legitimate successors, as the descendants of Amun, as the only people capable of restoring the true faith to a land that had renounced its god. <laughs> Pierre saw it as his divine duty to rebuild and extend the temple complex around Jebel Barkal. Naturally, in designing the walls, he fell back on the pictorial language of the early pharaohs, in which they depicted their victories over the Mediterranean peoples and over the Kush Empire. This relief in the first courtyard of the Temple of Amun lay buried for many years. It portrays Egyptian dignitaries crawling in the dust before Pie, the new pharaoh. All that remains of the ruler himself is a huge foot. Self-confidently, he styled himself King of Egypt and of all lands. A sacrificial table bears the name of the donor. When Pierre died, his corpse was taken 30 kilometers down the Nile to Al-Kuru, the oldest burial site in the Kush Empire. Still located close by today is a Muslim cemetery. These piles of gravel are all that remain of what were once the first pyramids in Sudan. Because even in death, Pierre set an example. He revived the tradition of building stone pyramids, which in Egypt had long since been abandoned. In contrast to the Egyptian structures on which they were modeled, the Nubian pyramids were much steeper and standing some 30 meters, not as high. Originally, they completely covered the burial chamber hewn deep in the bedrock. So construction could only begin after the ruler had died. This form of burial was cultivated in the kingdom of Kush for over a thousand years. The upper class embraced the culture and religion of the defeated neighboring nation more and more but the lives of the farmers and nomads remained largely unaffected. Mm -hmm. 
the Nile dictated the pace of life, as it still does today. Whether it's the Temple of Amun, the pharaohs, white or black, or the present-day government in Khartoum, alongside the life-bringing river, everything else pales into insignificance. Pierre's successors left their homeland and ruled as pharaohs from Memphis. From then on, the history of the Kush Empire went hand in hand with that of Egypt. Only in death did the black pharaohs all return to Jebel Bakal. The last, and perhaps the most important of the black pharaohs, was Taharqa. In the 26 years of his reign, the empire covered its greatest expanse, extending from Libya to Asia Minor, from the Phoenician ports to Meroe in central Sudan. The many temples built by Taharqa testify to his particular interest in religious issues. The Temple of Hathor at the foot of Jebel Barkal is an impressive example of the skill of his architects. Hathor, the mother of mothers and the goddess of love, is depicted as a cow, but also with a woman's face and cow's ears. An inscription describes Tahaka as the son of the sun god and ruler over Upper and Lower Egypt. But the holiest of holies lies deep in the rock. The colors have survived for 2,700 years. On a relief, Tahaka on the right makes a sacrifice to Amun in the center, the god who resides within the mountain. The pillar of Jebel Barkal as a cobra, together with the sun. Visible from afar, at one time a golden tablet atop the 70 meter high pillar proclaimed the king's fame. Then fortune deserted the black pharaoh. Egypt was conquered by the Assyrians. Five years later, an embittered Tahaka died in his homeland. Originally 60 meters high, his pyramid tomb in Nuri on the opposite bank of the Nile was the biggest ever built in Sudan. Henceforth, the Kushites were worlds away from the political stage of the Mediterranean. But in their heartland, around the Holy Mountain, their kings continued to rule for many generations. <laughs>